Hi, very good morning. Watching Trading Hour on CNBC TV 18. I'm Ekta Batra and my co-anchor Prashant Nair will be joining us very soon, in fact, with some interesting statistics. But before that, just to apprise you of what's happening with the markets, yes, we're back at 10,000. So the Nifty has managed to retrace 10,000. In fact, if you look at it from uh, 28th of September, uh, we have actually gained around 3-odd percent for the Nifty in terms of uh, the low that we had seen, which was sub-9700. So it's around a 3% cumulative run that we've seen for the Nifty since that trading session. But overall, what also stands out is uh, the Bank Nifty today. So the Bank Nifty is managing to outperform marginally at this point in time. So it's up around 3 tenths of a percent. Lot of stocks in focus. So something like Spark, which uh, gets your attention because of the decline that we're seeing, down 8-odd percent. Titan, which is up around 4 odd percent, as well as something like Biocon because of that Pegfil Grastim uh, TAD, which is from the USFD and expected tonight, and JP Associates, where that restructuring is approved in terms of the uh, debt. So that stock is up around 3 odd percent. But one particular statistic that we've been tracking every month is the mutual fund inflows, which have come off their all time highs that we saw in the month of August. Not to mention, it is still high above around 18,000 odd cross as compared to 20,000 cross in the month of August. Prashant is here with all of the numbers and what it means. Prashant, over to you. Ekta, hi, good morning. Uh, so as you said, the numbers in the month of September are off uh, what we saw in the month of August, but they are still extremely strong. Uh, August was a very strong month. I mean, we saw 20,000 crores plus worth of uh, inflows into equity mutual funds. That was August. Uh, and uh, that basically was uh, uh, compared to about under 13,000 crores in the previous month. So 13,000 crores in July, 20,000 crores in August. And I think it's but natural that uh, after such a big jump, I mean, the figure consolidates maybe, as they say, in market parlance. So just under 19,000 crores is the number that we've got uh, as inflow into equity mutual funds in the month of September. This is basically about 7% lower. I mean, as the number uh, is uh, showing, about 7% lower in September as compared to August. But I mean, just compared the uh, number in uh, September to what we, saw, what we saw in July, which is under 13,000 crores, you go back, you get to uh, 8,000 crore uh, figure type of numbers, uh, 9,500. I mean, in April, it was about 9,429 odd crores or so. So it's still, I mean, double of what we saw when we began this financial year. In April, it was 9,400 crores, and we had about 19,000 crores. I mean, so I guess one could uh, shrug, shrug one's shoulders and say big deal, even though it's off a little bit as compared to August. Now, this is the, I mean, I, I always break it up in terms of flows into equity mutual funds, uh, which is basically pure equity plus uh, ELSS equity. And a balanced funds. I mean, let's uh, change the graphic to the next one. And this is inflow into balanced funds, right? I mean, and this has uh, also been consistently growing. It's off the high that we saw in August, about 8,783 8, crores. In September, it was 8,140 crores. Uh, many assume that uh, about 50%, I mean, actually, it, it could be more, but about 50% of the balance fund inflow is allocate, allocated into equities, into stocks. So you add about 4,000 crores to the 18,000, uh, almost 19,000 crore figure. I mean, you're basically looking at some 23,000 crores in terms of equity, ELSS, plus 50% of balance fund, uh, balance fund inflow. So it's, uh, as I said, I mean, any way you cut it, off the month of uh, August, but I think it's still extremely strong uh, from even, I mean, if, uh, when compared to a, pr a few months back. Back to you. Yes, absolutely, Prashant. Thanks very much for that. Uh, so that is on the mutual fund inflows. But let's talk uh, stocks now. We have GSPL, which is actually surging around 5-odd percent. They've come out with a press release that they've received around 1,121 crores. This is after the sale of the oxygen plant assets has been completed to Shrey, uh, with Shrey Equipment Finance. So that's the reason why you're seeing that spike come in uh, up around 5-odd percent currently for GSPL. It has been strong through the day, but nonetheless, you can see that little bit of a spike which has come in. But let's get talking technicals now. We have Sudarshan Sakani with us this morning to discuss that. Well, Sudarshan, we're back at 10,000. So what's your sense? Uh, will we stay here? And what's your strategy? Yeah, good morning again. Well, we have been long for the last 10 days. Now, uh, today, uh, the idea has been to take profits on these positions and step aside. See, we are back at 10,000. It's a psychological resistance. 
the Nifty has also pulled back or retraced about 61% of its decline. Now, 61% retracement is often a str strong resistance level. Uh, I cannot say if it will stay as resistance or not, but at current levels, uh, the risk is probably more than the reward for keeping long positions. So step aside, close your long positions, bank your profits and wait patiently in the next two, three days for some consolidation or dip to re-enter on the buy side. This is not a, a suggestion to go short, absolutely not. Just become flat in your positions for the nifty. In most other stocks, buying would be suggested. Uh, okay, so uh, what are the stock uh, specific trades, Darshan? Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, let's go for uh, uh, mid caps mainly. Tech Mahindra is a buy. Actually, all IT stocks are now buying opportunities, including Infi. So we had HCL Tech in the morning after the markets opened. Tech Mahindra is also in the same league. Buying is possible here, and I think you could also carry positions. The second buy is Madhusan Sumi. This is a stock that keeps relentlessly going up pauses, consolidates, continues its up move. So Madhusan Sumi is a buy as it breaks out of a consolidation pattern. And finally, Bajaj Auto, we've all heard how the numbers for some of the auto companies were very good, and that is reflecting in the momentum in share prices. So even now, it's a buying opportunity. Do not go short in this market. Nothing in the bank nifty? No, the bank nifty is now just performing. For the last three days, it was underperforming. So I think it's best uh, the bank nifty and the nifty are left alone for the day. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's get in those Twitter queries now, Sudarshan, this morning. The first one is from Ramana. She wants to know if she can buy Ultratech Cement and Canfin Finance for the long term. Your advice? Yes, remember, we are just in the beginnings of a long term bull market. So Ultratech is one of the better stocks. Go ahead and buy it. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same about Canfin. I'm assuming it's Canfin Home, home Finance. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a stock that has run up far more, yes. It's run up far more than what we could have imagined. This is not the place you want to buy it. You want it to pause for a year, two years, have deep corrections. So, Canfin is not a buying opportunity, but Ultratech is. Okay, uh, we have another question, and this is uh, IMAD, uh, is the name. He has 250 shares of Jet Airways purchased at 580 rupees and wants to know if he should hold or sell. 250 shares of Jet purchased at 580. Uh, Sudarshan, your uh, thoughts on Jet? Well, yes, see, it's now 485, 490. So the time to exit has already gone. At current levels, Jet is standing at a, a reasonably strong support base. So now you have to hold on. In a bull market, it's generally worthwhile holding on to shares. So hold on for one year, you'll probably get your cost price and maybe even a profit. Okay, fair enough, Sudarshan. We're going to let you go now. Thanks very much for joining and taking us through those strategies. Rahul Shah is also with us to tell us about uh, strategies in the FNO space. So Rahul, over to you. I think uh, what the way, way the market is set up, I think two sectors which has been outperforming. One is auto and uh, metal which has been we've seen a renewed interest uh, continuously so in that space i have two stock ideas from that uh, uh, space so i think auto first let's take about talk about auto auto we've seen auto index as a whole has been doing quite well and a few select stocks we have seen a long added so in that space i've been uh, liking and tool a space bajaj auto so i would buy bajaj auto with a stop loss of 3110 and target of 3230 Second, as I said, metal have been you know doing quite well, and again, metal index has been one of the best performing in uh, in last couple of months. So in that space, GSW Steel is my top idea. So I would buy GSW Steel with a stop loss of 253 and target of 275. Third, from a mid 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 cap space, I think Tata Power is one stock. We have seen some longs building it up and stock consolidating from 77 to 85 levels. So I would buy uh, Tata Power with a stop loss of 79 and target of 85. Thanks very much. Appreciate you joining in. Good uh, getting that uh, perspective from you. Okay, let's move on to an important story, uh, which is also going to come up at the bottom of the screen in terms of flashes. Uh, so this is essentially the insolvency and bankruptcy code, uh, where uh, there is some changes which are being uh, made. And this essentially is uh, is, uh, at the provocation of banks and lenders who are facing issues. Ritu is now joining in uh, with uh, some of the key changes which are being discussed. Ritu, good morning. Good morning, Prashant. Uh, that's right, you know, it's been a few months now since uh, uh, 
many of the cases have started moving in the NCLT and uh, with that experience there's a lot of issues that the bankers have been facing and these are the concerns that they've raised with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, with the uh, you know IDC chairman and uh, these are some of the changes that have been proposed now how many of those do get uh, applied eventually is something that remains to be seen but these are important concerns first uh, you know what they cite is uh, the fact that they have to disclose the liquidation value of an asset which is essentially the scrap value of the asset at the time that the information memorandum is floated by the IRP means that they're not getting the kind of valuation they would have gotten otherwise. In fact, lenders, we spoke to side that if they were getting, uh, say, about 50, 60 cents to a dollar now, they're not even getting half that price because this liquidation value has been disposed. Second, uh, the non-fund based exposures of banks are not being counted currently and therefore the lenders with just non-fund based exposures do not even have a say in the committee of creditors. That is again something that they've asked, uh, you know, the committee to look into and to change. The other thing is uh, the committee of creditors does not exactly work like the joint lender forum. Uh, in that, uh, recently JRF guidelines were revised such that there's a quicker resolution with only 50 to 60 percent of approvals required in terms of value and number. But COC still works with the old, uh, in the old-fashioned way. We, where 75 percent of the lenders will have to approve for the proposal to go through, and that is again something that is hampering the proceedings, it's delaying it to some extent. And lastly, one of the key issues raised is. Uh, uh, the IRP, once he takes over, yes, he takes over the power of, of the board and the promoter, but given that the promoter in certain cases may still have shareholding in the company, he can still go ahead and disrupt proceedings in an annual general meeting. Because remember, under the company's law, uh, any change or sale of assets over 10% requires shareholder approval. So this is, again, something that they think can hamper resolution processes, and these are some of the key changes that they have proposed. Ritu, uh, just one quick point. The, where you started with the uh, disclosure of the liquidation value right at the beginning, right, of the process, uh, along with the information memorandum. I mean, uh, during the standstill period, uh, the, the IRP tries to get a resolution in place between the lender, between the lenders and the uh, company in question. Uh, so, disclosure of liquidation value. I mean, how does that hamper things in any way? Because liquidation is if no resolution is found after that period of 180 days. See, a, a, what the lenders had to say is the liquidation value, as I said, it's disclosed at the time of the preparation of the information memorandum, which is just the scrap value. Uh, now, this is something that uh, they said for many of the cases, especially the last few sector, uh, if a buyer was interested in a particular asset and was quoting a value based on the market value that they perceived, now with this information uh, available to them on the liquidation value, uh, which is essentially, you know, this is uh, the far edge where the lenders may be pushed. And, you know, if one of the lenders decides to exit, it could be used as a tool uh, to sort of uh, get a much lower valuation. So this is uh, the value. Uh, the valuation is actually done by a chartered accountant, uh, which in turn is employed by the IRP. Uh, 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 so this is something that uh, they have a key concern against, that uh, if the liquidation value is X, Y, Z, the price being quoted is not much above that. Okay, fair enough. That point is taken, Ritu. So uh, The market's up about, what, six or points, not very much left there. 9985 is where the index is uh, trading at. I just want to quick, quickly take a look at some stocks uh, in the futures and options space where there is some give back going on. Let's start with Adani Enterprises, down 5%. Uh, it, ha it had a good last week. O OBC, of course, has got new slow, three and three quarters of a percent lower on OBC, under under 120. Look at Jubilant uh, Foods, which again went up almost 11, 12 percent last week, uh, is down about two and three quarters. And then you got Biocon and REC, which are the other two percent cuts. I mean, so actually about six odd FNO stocks uh, with losses in excess of uh, two percent, which is not bad actually. Manisha is joining in with what's happening at the India Energy Forum, which is being held in New Delhi. She is live with us. Manisha, good morning. Morning, Prashant. Thank you so much for that. Well, yes, the crude oil prices are moving in the positive direction. Remember, last week was a weak day, a weak week actually. But today in Asia, we've started positive. We were actually chatting with the OPEC Secretary General, who says that you can expect extraordinary moves in the market next year to ensure that there is rebalance in demand and supply. He also says that in the month of November, when the OPEC meets for its official meeting, there are more members perhaps who would be a part of this agreement as well, and that clearly has been supportive of the crude oil prices. There, of course, have been statements from Iran as well saying that they are retort or they do not uh, 
take in strong the sanctions that have come in from US and that seems to be adding some premium to the prices as well. But you have all the big voices when it comes to the global energy markets here in Delhi and there has been a lot of discussion as well when it comes to the Indian markets here. Well, investment is something that everybody seems to be talking about on how the sector is underinvested, but there has been a lot of interest from a lot of these oil producers and exporters on how they want to be a part of the Indian market here in sense of a JV or trading, taking a strategic partnership here or even uh, increasing their market share. So uh, you actually have seen uh, uh, numbers come out as well where they say that India's crude oil consumption growth has been at 7.5% as compared to 1.8% globally. So they do look at India as a major consumer here and uh, you know most of the voices will also tell you that it is a buyer's market right now with the oversupply and with the kind of robust demand that India is showcasing and its uh, projections as well coming in for the next 5 to 10 years, you perhaps are looking at much more interest coming in for the Indian markets. Of course, technology, private partnership, uh, expenditure, finding more basins, gas policy are some of the uh, key concern areas that the markets are looking at. But apart from that, it is a very bullish voice coming in for India. We also spoke to Atul Arya, who is the chief oil strategist at IHS. And he also is of the voice that Indian markets are here to grow. And gas is something that India needs to really correct going forward. We see oil and demand and supply coming into a balance probably sometime in the first half of uh, next year. What has happened, as you know, is that uh, over the course of last three years, really since 2014 when, uh, when OPEC had a big surplus of supply, prices fell down, the U.S. production went down. We have seen this long period of adjustment. And that adjustment period is now really coming to an end in the sense that U.S. production really went down quite significantly. Globally, we haven't invested so much. Uh, and that is starting to impact the supply part. And the demand actually has been stronger than uh, we had thought. Particularly this year, mm. uh, demand has been very strong in Asia, here in India and in China, but also in Europe. Uh, so, so that has all helped. And so we think that the market is coming into balance sometime next year. I don't think it's 2020. It's, it's more like 2018 during the first half of 2018. All right. Let's talk about India more. And while we keep talking about investments here, what is your sense? Is it going to be technology, more investment, further digging deeper in India that would really push the sector forward? Yeah. So India is, uh, to me, is a very exciting place to be. India needs a lot of investment you know, in oil and gas. You know, India is importing more than 80 percent and that import dependence is growing uh, mainly because the consumption is growing. So, uh, so what is happening with the policies uh, the current administration has put in, Prime Minister Modi, uh, Minister Pradhan, I think they are all coming to fruition. I think the challenge for India has been that all those policies are in the backdrop of a low price. Mm. So with low prices, companies are cutting down on their investment and they're very picky. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit of a you know, tough uh, challenge for the government, uh, but they're doing a number of things, including the policies they have implemented this year. Uh, so I feel very, very optimistic that mo more international companies are going to come into India. That will help grow India's, low, you know, indigenous production over time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you did the maths or not, but, but you know, uh, with the petrol and diesel prices in India right now, we are standing at those levels when the crude prices were $100 and plus. So, uh, of course, it's the Indian tax uh, uh, system that yeah. which actually keeps the prices higher. But what do you think India needs to change when it comes to pricing policies? Well, I think the very good thing they have done on pricing is on, as you say, on petrol and diesel. There is still some more room to go there, for example, kerosene, which is a more difficult issue because, you know, kerosene is used by a lot of poor people. Uh, but the policy has moving in the right direction. Now, I think the, uh, the next big policy change is going to be in the matter of gas price. Mm -hmm. uh, and the gas price in the country domestically is, is you know, not really linked to the global price, uh, oil prices. So I think what we need to figure out, the government needs to figure out, is how to transition that domestic gas price to become uh, at parity with the international price. It doesn't need to happen overnight, doesn't need to happen in a year, but over a period of time. And there was a step taken, you know, last year. So I think uh, slowly, I, I do hope, there will be more steps taken by the government in the next uh, months and year uh, and bring that parity. Consolidating now, so after that top move that we saw above 10,000, we're just about uh, trading with a little bit of a positive bias, more for the Sensex as compared to the Nifty at this point in time. Um, a couple of stocks, however, from the frontliner stand out. So Dr. Reddy's is up around 2 percent. 
Uh, remember that stock has already given returns significantly in the past couple of weeks, for example, up around 4% this month after that Copaxon launch, which has taken place for them. So that stock is doing okay now. And uh, we have Indusind Bank, which is holding up quite well. We do have the numbers, which will be coming out this Thursday on the 12th. Uh, so that'll be interesting to watch. It really kicks off earning season. So it'll be interesting to watch what Indusind delivers, especially also on, in terms of commentary with regards to Bharat Financial. But uh, Ashwini Gujal is here with us to talk about the number, sorry, to talk about the markets now. Ashwini, hi, over to you. Uh, well, it is numbers actually for the Nifty. 9988 is currently where we're at, how you're approaching it. Uh, and what's your view on the Bank Nifty as well, which is managing to uh, outperform just about marginally? Well, we are holding on to 9980. Uh, so that means the market is trying to develop a higher support. I think Bank Nifty is also uh, trying to hang on to 24,250. So this dip, uh, you know, should be bought. And uh, the odds are that uh, if uh, the banks are able to come out of their range-bound action, uh, we will get higher levels. So uh, I would think uh, this is just an intraday decline, uh, which should resolve on the upside. As far as individual stocks are concerned, uh, Indusin Bank is a buy with a stop of 1690, target of 1750. Uh, PVR is a buy with a stop of 1340, target of 1385. And HSIL is a buy with a stop of 410, target of 445. Ashwini, I mean, uh, just look at uh, SRF uh, and what's going on there. Big move. See, SRF has uh, broken through its 200-day uh, moving average on the upside. So now, you know, we could uh, possibly, uh, you know, target 1780, 1800, but uh, it's not been in any sort of great uptrend. So maybe uh, this leads to a fresh uptrend, but overall, uh, I think still a very sideways type stock between 1400 and 1900. Ashni, have you had a look at uh, Panacea Biotech? That stock is uh, surging today. Well, you know, this sort of stock uh, keeps doing this uh, mm -hmm. off and on, but nothing really uh, comes out of it. It's been in an uptrend today. Uh, it's completing some kind of correction. So possibly, you know, 280, 300 is possible in this kind of momentum. So there seems to be some sort of, uh, you know, uptrend which has started and which is continuing. I don't specifically uh, track AU Finance. Okay, then, um, it's not been listed for that long. I think it's the fourth month for AU as far as stock markets are concerned. I think we have some queries, Ekta. Yes, uh, well, first one, Ashwini, for you. Vicky, 10,000 shares of um, Trident, which is ba bought at 102. He wants your advice on the f way forward for that one. Well, it's in uh, an uptrend. So, uh, 92 is your stop. And maybe 130, 135... Uh, would be a good uh, target to keep on uh, Trident. Okay, and last one for the day, um, at least on this show, Ashwini is final query from AC Ramesh. He wants to invest 1 lakh and seeks advice on which uh, brokerage firm stocks he should buy for the same. See, broker dealers are in, uh, you know, some sort of uh, bull market. So, uh, Edelweiss is a good one. 250 is your stop. And, uh, you know, if you really hold on, maybe in a couple of years, uh, it could double from here. Hmm. Okay. Fair enough, Ashwini. We're going to let you go on that note. Thanks uh, very much for joining in, TKS, through all of those strategies. Well, for the markets, the Bank Nifty is just about managing to outperform. And we have a positive advance decline ratio standing a little over 1 is to 1. At the Points on the Nifty now, 9,992. The mid-cap index is in the red, but barely so. The Nifty Bank is up about a quarter percent. Pankaj Tibrewal is a senior vice president and equity fund manager at Kotak Mutual Fund. He's now joining in. Uh, Pankaj, good morning. Good to have you here. My first question is with regards to the uh, SEBI norms on mutual fund uh, classification, right, which came through on Friday evening. Uh, one uh, impact which was being talked about even before the actual uh, thing came was that many, since uh, SEBI is only going to allow one fund in each category, uh, it will lead to merging, uh, merger of funds, etc. Various schemes of, uh, will have to be merged into one. But if when you read through the circular, you find that under each category, like for example, under equity, 
as a category. There are 10 types of schemes which, are, which have been allowed. Uh, so has SEBI left enough room that, uh, uh, you know, with reclassification in the offer document, investment style being changed, I mean, or, or, you know, majority of the funds may continue. Uh, looks like uh, I think the category they have told under the equity seems to be quite broad based. Uh, however, uh, I think it will relate to reduction in the number of schemes which are there in the marketplace today. And it will simplify the definitions which each of the fund house is following in terms of large cap, mid cap, small cap, how they define value, how they define contra. So it's a welcome step. Uh, it, the step was expected for a long period of time. And let's see how the industry submit their plan going forward to the regulator on what their individual fund house plans are. So difficult to comment at this stage which fund house will follow what strategy, but it's a welcome step uh, let uh, me, uh, going forward. Let me use a, a specific example. If a fund house has a large cap fund, say for example it has two funds which operate as large caps, right? One fund has 80% of its portfolio in large caps. Another fund has, say, 65% of its portfolio as large caps. The first fund, no problem. SEBI defines large caps as, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's un uh, I mean, large cap uh, fund scheme as 80% equity exposure, it's, so it's fine. Second fund, I mean, just has to realign its portfolio a little bit, change uh, what it says to its investors in the offer document, and it may be able to, under the new classification, continue as a focus fund or whatever. Absolutely. So that's what I said, uh, that uh, within a fund house, there may be many schemes. Uh, there may be overlap in the asset allocation strategy uh, in each of the categories. So the fund house now needs to go to the regulator and submit the plan, what they plan to do with the number of schemes which they have, whether they want to merge, whether they want to reclassify the asset allocation in their uh, said and offer document and go back to the investors and say that this is a change in asset allocation. So I think in the next two months, some more clarity will emerge on what's the strategy of each fund house uh, and what's the reduction in the schemes each one is opting for. Hmm. Pankaj, do you expect these changes to probably impact flows uh, at least temporarily? Uh, doesn't look like, I mean, if you look at uh, the September month, the flows were uh, quite strong. Uh, even uh, you look at the year-to-date flows, flows have been quite strong. So I think the broader thesis uh, of the financialization of savings remains in the country. Uh, and, and wherever we are traveling, uh, we go to B15 cities, I think people have learned the hard way. Uh, yes, you will see a lot of people trying to uh, you know, uh, take punt on the individual stocks without research, without just on hearsay. But going forward, a lot of people have admitted to the fact that leave it to best to the money managers who are managing it uh, for a longer term uh, perspective. And that SIP book, which uh, probably is 5,000, 5,200 crores, I see it a long runway for growth going forward. Uh, and in the next five, seven years, we believe that uh, this uh, asset management industry uh, could grow in tune of 15 to 17 percent CAGR over the next five years on this space. So clearly, we there may be short-term phenomena, but if you just ignore that uh, because of any of these reasons which you mentioned, uh, the medium to long-term outlook still remains very robust for the industry. Hmm. We've seen uh, more resilience come in for the broader markets, for the mid-caps as compared to the Nifty, at least in the last uh, couple of weeks. Pankaj, what's your view? Do you think that uh, maybe there's a bit of frothiness developing in the broader markets or are you preferring uh, frontline stocks over mid caps? What's your strategy? So clearly over the last three to six months, you have seen uh, especially the small cap segment doing exceedingly well. Uh, year to date, uh, calendar year to date, small cap segment is up by 35%. Uh, and clearly a lot of stocks are doubling um, very fast. I think that gives us uh, some bit of caution. I think uh, clearly a lot of cyclical businesses are being given structural P where there's a visibility of one or two quarter of earnings, people are just lapping it up and giving it a, a very high PE uh, on the high elevated earnings. So there's some bit of cautiousness which we believe should be uh, used at this stage of time. Uh, our approach is that have a quality oriented approach, stick to quality businesses which will deliver over a period of time. And we believe that there will be cycles where uh, momentum stocks, where cyclical stocks may do well for a very short period of time. But when the sanity prevails, you need to be in a quality-oriented company. Mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, get your thoughts on 
-hmm. Where uh, you, you, I mean, if you, uh, without, of course, naming names, where you see these opportunities, sectors, subsectors, Pankaj? So clearly one mega theme which we believe is clearly underway is on the financial side. Uh, if you look at the uh, banking side, clearly uh, the mega theme which is working is uh, PSU is losing market share uh, and clearly the private uh, banks, uh, especially the retail oriented private sector banks and NBFC is gaining market share. So clearly that's one mega theme which is underway that today uh, the PSU banking sector which is about uh, 70 percent uh, slowly will lose market share over the period of time because of lack of capital, NPA problems, talent problems, uh, IT technology issues and so and so forth. So that one mega trend where we are positioned ourselves in our portfolio more towards private oriented banks, yes there will be a, a trading rally or a cyclical rally in the PSU's bank at some point of time as the NPA recoveries starts to happen. But more uh, structurally if you speak that's the way the trend is moving. The second sector I believe uh, where we are excited about is the consumer discretionary part. Um, we are at the cusp of about $1,700 to $1,800 and uh, we believe as the moment we cross $2,000 there is an inflection curve. There is a J curve in a lot of consumer discretionary sectors like retailing, food packaging and so and so forth and uh, a lot of our portfolios are positioned towards the uh, companies in those sectors. So, uh, cement is another one name where we believe that the supply side uh, will make sure that the pricing power is in the hands of manufacturers and clearly uh, we are overweight on cement in many of our funds uh, for a long period of time. Uh, the fourth sector which probably uh, looks good is the uh, FMIG which is the fast moving industrial goods uh, co corollary to FMCG uh, where we believe a lot of bearing, palms, abrasive companies fits in because our view is that private capex will still 12 to 18 months away but the capacity utilization in many of the sectors will start improving and we are seeing already in some of the sectors the capacity utilization is improving where most of these consumables will be used so these are the four or five broader themes where our portfolios are positioned today come to the big story of the day tata sun's head honcho and chandra spoke to cnbc tv 18 in his first interview after taking over tata sun's in a freewheeling chat with shireen ban chandra says it is his number one priority to find a solution for tata tele services listen in you've been trying to find a solution for ttsl for a while you've been on the lookout for a buyer you haven't found one so uh, if a, how much more runway do you actually have before you take a call on whether you pull the plug all together? And B, uh, where do things stand with the possibility of finding a buyer for that business? See, whichever way, uh, I have uh, given myself Tata Tele Services as a number one priority mm. to find a solution. And I had steel also, then that deal has been done. On Tata Tele Services, I am at a point that I need to make a call. Okay. Okay, I'm looking at all options. Um, I'll figure out a way this fiscal year. This fiscal year. Yeah. So that could mean closing down the business altogether? It could mean anything. Yeah. It basically the 30, means that I debt. don't want to put good money after bad money. Hmm. I have a situation where already the debt is about 31,000 crores. Additionally, I have spectrum liability. Um, and uh, we are making losses, cash loss on a month-on-month -month basis. So it is not a business that uh, I can easily turn around unless or otherwise I'm willing to commit another 50, 100,000 crores. Mm. Uh, and you're not willing not, to put that and money. that's not prudent. Mm. So I will make a call. I am at the point now. Don't ask me whether it is this month, this quarter, next quarter. You said this financial But year. I am this financial. I would like to, I would like to find a solution. Uh, do you still believe that there is a possibility of finding a buyer? I mean, let's not... Uh, uh, speculate hmm. because uh, you've been in talks every, I mean, every it, newspaper it, exactly your exactly. channel other channels exactly. uh, has been speculating yes in fact the speculations have been more than what is really happening huh. so, so i don't want to so add would, to it, it. would it be fair to say that the interest from a potential buyer uh, at this point in time is not looking particularly bright so let us leave it at a, at a statement okay that i have to find a solution and i'm committed to finding a solution one way or the other I think uh, the market's just about there, I mean, not really uh, going anywhere, uh, with, uh, but still in the green, I think that's what one can say about it. Uh, we have Mr. H.P. Singh, founder and managing director of Saturn Credit Care, a uh, Delhi-based microfinance lender, uh, to discuss uh, essentially the company's fundraise. Uh, 
Mr. Singh, thanks very much. Good morning. So we understand the QIP has been uh, closed. How much have you raised? Uh, who all have come in uh, as part of the uh, QIP and at what price? Uh, so the price has been at uh, 305 rupees, uh, and uh, we've closed uh, 150 crore uh, QIP right now. And in terms of our, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the raise which has been given to our borrowers, it's been uh, DSP BlackRock, uh, uh, Builder Mutual Fund, uh, UTI Mutual Fund, and Morgan Stanley. Okay. Uh, Mr. Singh, this is your fourth fundraising that I can see in the past year or the same time last year you did a QIP and after that you've had two preferential allotments or maybe one preferential allotment, one issue and now again a QIP. Um, reason for that? Uh, so our first uh, QIP was before the before demonetization uh, which was in October. So we raised about 250 crore at that point of time. Uh, then Asian Development Bank came in in uh, April uh, uh, by about $10 million and uh, promoters put in some equity. Uh, we did a small preferential uh, raise uh, with Capital First uh, and that was a business and a strategic tie-up. And uh, now this raise which is coming and I think purely this raise is uh, technically in terms of our growth uh, which we find that it is probably uh, taken whatever it has been after demonetization and I think we are right on the growth progress and that is why uh, we needed this capital for our growth. So are you done now? As in is this, uh, uh, do you have more plans in terms of fundraising or is this enough? Well for now we think we are done. Uh, we probably uh, will look if anything very strategic comes up. We definitely will try and see to that. But uh, as far as for the growth capital what we need right now I think we are done with it. Uh, what about credit costs, Mr. Singh? I mean, where are we on that? What's the situation like? Uh, the situation is getting better on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, so the collection efficiency is wherever it has been. I think, you know, they're touching right now, uh, whatever it was, the pre-demonetization level. Uh, so our sense is, I think, credit costs, whatever had to come, has probably come in, and I think, you know, for us, uh, it's, it's probably the uh, more positive things which are going forward now. Mm -hmm. uh, could you give us some indication about uh, what kind of growth Etc. You're seeing. I mean, if and also is uh, you said credit. I mean, the worst of cre uh, credit costs is behind. You said right. The collection yeah, efficiency the is where it was pre-November of last year. Yeah. About what kind yes, of growth yes. growth do you see? Uh, growth. I think you know uh, it goes according to our guidance which we've given for March 18. You know, so we will probably be growing at about uh, about a 40 percent to 50 uh, percent growth. And uh, right now, if you look at uh, the quarters which we've already done, I think we are right now uh, on track uh, of it. And I think we'll probably be there uh, uh, with a 40 to 50 percent growth uh, by March 18. Okay. Uh, just a quick statistic on collection efficiency. Where exactly do you stand? Uh, collection efficiency, if I give you a perspective from whatever disbursements we made from January onwards till now, I think we are at about 99.2%. You know. So that's, that's where we are. Mr. Singh, thanks very much. Good speaking with you. Good luck with that capital uh, that you will, of course, put to work. And we hope to catch up with you once the results uh, for the quarter uh, are out later this month. We'll. Uh, Wrap up this uh, edition of Trading Hour. The market is absolutely lackluster. We got about a nine on point gain on the Nifty 9988. Uh, some news with regards to Kalpatru Power at the bottom of the screen. Uh, 1060 or crore order is what they have backed. Uh, stay tuned. Halftime report is going to take that and more forward.